All right. Hello, everyone. My name is James, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Welcome to Achieving Intelligent Oil Rig Automation to Unlock the Future of Autonomous Operations. Joining us today is MOX's Industry Marketing Manager for Oil and Gas and Semiconductors, Ross Mahler. Ross has extensive knowledge of IIoT, including developing hardware and AI and machine learning software, business development, and project managing large-scale applications in the harshest environments around the globe. Our first guest speaker is Rick Hornung, Senior Manager of Information Technology at Goodnight Midstream. Rick leads the IT team at Goodnight Midstream, and he's responsible for the needs of both OT and enterprise requirements spanning multiple locations. Also joining us from Goodnight Midstream is Robert Kempner, who is a business intelligent, intelligence engineer. And Robert is instrumental in designing, building, and deploying reporting infrastructure that transforms data into real-time operational monitoring and actionable business insights. So a couple of housekeeping items before we jump into our presentation today. The webinar is 60 minutes, including time for questions at the end. If you'd like to submit questions, please use that Q&A function. The recording will be shared, so you can go back and watch the webinar on demand. And there will also be a survey after the webinar. We appreciate your feedback on the presentation. And with that in mind, I'll pass it off to Ross to kick off our webinar. Ross. Excellent. Thanks, James. Um, today we'll be covering MOXA's IO2 solutions, the differences between automation and autonomy, and the building blocks of, that are needed for any autonomous system. Then we're really excited to hear from Goodnight Midstream and how they utilize MOXA's technologies for their IoT applications. And finally, we'll wrap up with some Q&A. The value that MOXA brings with our connectivity infrastructure is delivering reliable networks that can connect all things through automation and improve our productivity and efficiency of your control systems. Today, we'll be focused on the products designed for IoT applications of the oil and gas industry. Nowadays, security is absolutely critical for our edge computing, but at this time, it shouldn't limit your organization from scaling up to cover your expanding enterprise. And hardware must be industrial grade. Quite frankly, it's just gotta work in the harshest environments. MOXA offers a wide range of products that are class one div two certified, and rated for extreme temperatures that are common in this industry. One of the key products you'll hear about today is our AIG Edge Gateways, which provide everything you need out of the box with pre-built Things Pro and DLM software that's connected with Azure IoT, allowing customers to instantly load their existing images to quickly provision devices at scale. With this comprehensive portfolio, Moxa enables operational efficiency improvements by supporting predictive analytics and autonomous operations. Okay, so we wanted to do a quick poll um, and see if the audience knows the difference between automated and autonomous operations. Uh, so please feel free you know, to provide your answer to the poll question now. All right, see some good questions coming through here. Give everybody a few more minutes to make their selections. Okay, so I see there's a pretty decent mix um, between the selections there, which is great um, because we're about to actually get into a little bit of that as the next topic. So if you wanna go ahead and shut down that poll, that'd be great, thanks. All right, now I'll cover some of the differences between automation and autonomy, which as you'll see is a bit of a sliding scale. Um, automation involves decisions being made without human intervention. Um, some of the limitations though of automation are that it operates within a strict defined set of parameters um, and the possible tasks that it can complete are limited as a result. Uh, most notably, the criteria used for determining which actions should be taken is predefined. Um, so the available options are constrained because of that. On the other hand, um, autonomy means that the entire processes are performed with, without any human assistance, 
Um, this means that the system is operating under a wide range of uncertainties. However, it is still able to complete many workflows simultaneously. It provides the ability to understand and adapt to dynamic situations on the fly. And perhaps one of the most widely known differences is that it digests and learns from the new data faster than humans can. So to dive a little bit further into the sliding scale, um, here are the different levels of autonomy. Um, the first and perhaps most important thing for organizations to determine though, um, is what's the right level in amount of autonomy that your business needs to maximize its potential. Um, so a common misconception is that every business would benefit from implementing you know, full autonomous operations. Um, and however, you know, the truth is that um, full autonomy requires an immense amount of investment in resources and technologies um, to realistically um, achieve that. And honestly, it would be overkill for the majority of companies and what their needs are. So if we start on the left-hand side, um, you can see this is where the oil and gas industry all started, right? With everything being handled manually by the people that are on the rig. As we move to the assisted operation, this is the first step when data is introduced into the decision-making process. Um, and since we've already covered automation on the previous slides, I'll kind of skip over to the single workflow autonomy. Um, this stage begins to incorporate autonomous capabilities for analyzing simultaneous events, but it is limited to only one single workflow at a time. When we move over to the orchestrated autonomy level, this is uh, really a big jump. Right, in terms of how much your operations rely on these autonomous technologies. Um, because at this point, there's multiple layers of decision-making that's occurring um, without any human intervention. Um, so you know the processes are flowing on their own. And then finally, um, as we arrive to the full autonomy, um, this is where systems are running completely on autopilot, right? Um, obviously to implement this would mean that your organization has to fully trust in the system. Um, and it's been proven uh, to improve your operations throughout the lower levels. Um, and you're comfortable with the outcomes that it's going to deliver. All right, so now we have uh, one other poll. We wanted to see, since we've covered the differences, um, we'd like to know, um, does your organization currently utilize automated or autonomous or maybe both um, technologies for your operations? And we appreciate the feedback. You know, this helps us you know, learn more about our customers and where you're at in your digital transformation journeys. I'll see a lot of people that are already using autonomous. That's great. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Let's close that down. Next, we'll do, um, you know, since the majority of you actually just answered that um, you're either starting to or you're in the process of doing autonomous systems. Um, you might be saying, how do I get there though, right? Um, and so these are the key building blocks to any autonomous system. At the top level, you need a single integrated platform that you can run your analytical models at. Um, next, you're gonna need some form of the autonomous decision-making capabilities that we just mentioned pre previously, um, which can in some cases need to run from a remote control location. So not necessarily on the rig site, but um, in a remote location. And even with all of this excellent software and the analytics that we've been talking about so far, you still need the right hardware to get the job done. Um, sometimes the hardware is overlooked, uh, to be honest, during this development process. Uh, but don't be fooled, you know, without a reliable and fully interoperable network infrastructure, you know, your organization is not going to be able to fully realize all of those benefits um, that autonomy can provide. And the AI and Industry 4.0 um, discusses that you hear about all the conferences and the boardrooms. And this is why we believe that Moxa is the right partner for the job, because we have the complete infrastructure portfolio. Final topic I wanted to discuss um, is how we increase the adoption of AI in the oil field. So system integration bottlenecks prevent the EMP companies and drilling contractors from progressing towards further autonomy. Um, the solution, frankly, is agreements that allow these entities to integrate their automation applications with the rig operation systems. This provides access to high performance drilling capabilities, including autonomous drilling, uh, autonomous directional drilling. And with the addition of allowing operators to use their existing control systems, AI will be more prevalent in the industry going forward. Now I would like to bring in our valued customer from Goodnight Midstream, 
and introduce Rick Horning. Hello, my name is Rick Horning. My title is Senior Manager of Information Technology at Goodnight Midstream. I've been working in technology for over 20 years. I've been in this role for about six. I come from an enterprise background, so the industrial sector was new to me. Part of why I was brought on board is because Goodnight was looking to leverage enterprise technology methods in an industrial setting. So who are we? Well, we're a produced water pipeline and produced water disposal company. We operate pipelines and facilities in North Dakota, New Mexico, West Texas, and South Texas. We do take some truck traffic, but our primary focus is pipelining and disposal. We have about 650 miles of pipeline and 130 miles of our own fiber optic cable in the ground. So at the end of the day, technology in our industry really comes down to automation to reduce overhead, increase safety, and have good data so the business can make good decisions. Well, good night first got going, it required four people per facility to operate. Fast forward to today, now we have one manned facility per area, we call that a hub location. The hub location leverages our technology to man monitor and operate several facilities in the area around it. And we also have a centralized control room in Dallas that monitors all locations. So leveraging technology has allowed us to simultaneously reduce our overhead and double the number of eyes on an asset. So both the hub and the control room monitor our assets at the same time. So since we're on the produced water side of the energy industry, we don't have the same margins that big oil has. We're not making $30 a barrel. So for us, efficiency is key. We have to be smart with our decisions. Uh, smart decisions means we've got to have good data. So how do we do that? Well, we're an ignition shop. We run Ignition Edge on all of our AIGs. So there's an box at AIG 501 at every one of our facilities. We utilize the AIG Edge computers as our gateway. So every one of our AIGs is running Ignition Edge gateway. It's responsible for gathering all the data related to that disposal, including all the customer connections, and then feeding all that information back up to the central service at our data center, where we analyze it, monitor it, digest it. Company-wide, we pull about 500 PLCs and RTUs to gather all the data points we need to run operations. Our smaller deployments are about 100 tags, larger deployments, roughly 2,500 tags, and company-wide, we're at about 150,000 tags. This slide's just a high-level overview of our infrastructure. On the left side, this is the uh, centralized ignition infrastructure in our data center running on hyper-converged infrastructure. Uh, that's all running in Dallas. On the right, which is the primary focus of this webinar, that's the edge infrastructure running on organized hardware. You can see in the picture there, there's the AIG 501 making its connection out to the local PLC. Again, this is just a simplified explanation. And it makes outbound TLS connections up to the centralized servers to feed that information. And that's that's a two-way handshake. So once that connection is established, we can push controls back down through that same connection. This slide is mostly put in here. If there's any questions, we can come back to it. So we pull our most critical components every 20 seconds. Kind of a funny thing, when we first started building this system, we had it polling and displaying second by second data. Part of that is just because we wanted to we were messing with it. We wanted to see how the system reacted as close to real time as possible. When we let our users preview the system, they actually complained because all the numbers up on the screen kept changing and it was distracting to them. We found it interesting because we could poll second by second data and the system kept up just fine. Now, in real life, second by second data isn't realistic or terribly useful, but we were impressed that the system could do it nonetheless. So, why do we choose AIGs? Well, when we first started down the ignition path, I looked at a few different hardware vendors. And I'll go over the bullet points here of what made Moxes stand out for us. First, better warranty than similar competitor products. On an apples to apples comparison basis, Moxes just had a better warranty. Out of the box with Things Pro and Debian already loaded. Compatibility with Docker and Azure IoT out of the box. Again, these are important things. Some of the other vendors I talked to, they were like, 
oh, we've got a great hardware platform. We'll give it to you. You develop on it. And they kept telling me that you have to develop it. We'll give you a great platform to develop on. We're a small shop. I don't have a development team. I need to pull something out of the box that works. Uh, removable storage. We try to use removable storage in all of our hardware in the field because you never know who your remote hands is going to be at three o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. They may not be technical. So I want the ability to simply just transport the storage from one device to another. The AIG 501 has that ability. A device management with things pro and Moxa DLM. Again, I don't have a team to develop this stuff, develop this stuff for me. I need it to work out of the box. Excellent environmental ratings, you know, 158 degrees Fahrenheit on the AIG 501 and it's fanless. All the problems we've had in the past are related to dust and temperature. These ratings are really good on this device. Pre-sale support was excellent. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't want to make any promises for Moxa, but early on we were having some trouble with our ignition deployment. And it was actually Moxa that helped lead me to the answer. So that was good on Moxa. Uh, we're also looking for a small, organized package. In our newer facility builds, space isn't as much of an issue, but some of our older facilities that do retrofit, footprint was actually an issue. And of course, Windows, I didn't want that running out there at all. Yeah, I really wanted to avoid Windows for multiple reasons. Uh, the big ones were administrative overhead, security. And if you guys are paying attention, Windows 10 is coming up on end of life in 2025. I really want to avoid big forklift upgrades in the field. It's disruptive, disruptive and it's costly. When we were a one to shop running on custom hardware, if we had a catastrophic hardware failure on the edge, it took us 24 hours to turn around a new machine. Today, though, I can take a MOX out of the box, load ignition, restore backup, and have it connected in under 30 minutes. In this slide, it's a picture of a prototype we're working on. We actually have a different style of this in production today. But this is a truck offload kiosk. So the trucker bringing in uh, produced water, wants to dispose it, hooks up, walks up to this kiosk, pipes in his information, the well, volume, all that information that they write down on their tickets. This authorizes the user to be able to offload, and then they take their ticket and they scan it. This kiosk gathers all that information up, shoots it up to our data center, and then we can process billing in a matter of minutes. A lot of companies, they just gather up that paper ticket. They have to mail it to another place where they process it on site, and it's a lot of manual paperwork. You know, each ticket is what they use to bill off of. In this case, we get it within minutes, and the paper just becomes our backup. So this is prototype at this time. Truck volume has dropped off a little bit, so we're still using our existing kiosks. But if it picks back up again, we will finish this project and put it into production. We originally intended this to run off of an AIG 501. So, I mean, building the infrastructure is really all about getting good, reliable data so good decisions can be made. So with that, I'll hand it off to Robert, and he'll show us some samples of what we do with some of that data. All right. Uh, thanks, Rick. So my name is Robert Kempner. I've been at GoodNet for just over four years, building out our analytics and reporting infrastructure. Um, I have a background in mechanical engineering, and I kind of made my way into the data space through uh, working in research labs, and I needed to make sense of a huge amount of experimental data. And I came to GoodNet to make sense of our industrial data. So um, low latency and high quality data, it significantly impacts GoodNet's operations and business strategy. Uh, from our on-the-ground operators all the way up through executive decision-making, uh, the analytics that my team can deliver because of the data from these MOXA devices uh, provides valuable insights at every level of the business uh, and every department on any time scale. So um, with that, I'm going to dive into some specific examples of how we use this data. Um, so our investment in low-latency data infrastructure, it allowed us to build a suite of real-time analytical tools uh, that equip our control room, uh, like Rick was mentioning, uh, to make informed decisions quickly uh, across our midstream infrastructure. Um, and the ever-elusive midstream leaks are incredibly costly financially and environmentally, and these analytics can help us uh, mitigate that risk substantially. So the first example uh, at the top of this slide, um, it's a pressure monitoring system that calls out anomalous pressures uh, based on some statistical analysis. 
um, of historical data, uh, each horizontal line on that pipeline grid, it represents a specific location from the map. Uh, and that's the past 15 minutes of readings. Um, a red indicator indicates an anomalous pressure and a yellow indicator represents uh, pressure that's approaching anomaly. Um, so that in conjunction with the second dashboard shown below, um, that's our flow balancing dashboard. Uh, the line on the, the lines on the charts, uh, they show combined inlet flow rates and combined outlet flow rates uh, for the entire midstream pipeline system. Uh, and then the table on uh, the right side shows the actual hour by hour volume totals and the percent differences um, per hour. Uh, and so these two together, they allow our control room uh, to identify issues with uh, system health or potential leaks or any operational changes within minutes uh, of them happening. Uh, and as a result, they can quickly deploy our field personnel to issue, or sorry, to address any issues with the equipment uh, or mitigate any environmental uh, catastrophe in near real time. So beyond the control room, our operations team can use this data to analyze system behavior and asset health uh, to improve operating efficiencies. Um, uh, operations can see the downstream effects of specific operators coming on or turning off, uh, and then the midstream operating conditions as they change. Uh, the chart on the left, um, it's a high level view of uh, each of our midstream sections. So the dashboard is dynamic and we can change between the systems. Um, the first chart, uh, it shows the producer totals. Uh, each color is a different producer. Um, and you know, certain producers could have 10 or 15 different locations on a pipeline system. Uh, and this allows us to see uh, how producers affect our systems. Uh, the second chart in the middle uh, shows each goodnight facility inlet. And then the bottom one shows our downhole injection. And so we can kind of see from water origin to disposal how different things affect uh, our system in real time. Um, Downstream, our capacity is limited by the injection wells. And so our data is used to build some in-depth analysis of the well health and predictions uh, for well degradation. The analysis on the right, it shows a scatter plot of our downhole injection for a specific well. Uh, flow rate is across the x-axis and injection pressure is up the y-axis. Uh, the chart below the scatter plot, that small line chart, uh, it essentially shows the slope of the fit line through the scatter plot data over time. Uh, this allows us to see well health uh, and how it changes over time, uh, you know, allowing us to make decisions on maintenance uh, for these assets that, uh, you know, are the key indicator for our overall system capacity. Um, and we can see uh, instant changes within minutes, and we know the effects of our maintenance uh, within minutes as well. Uh, beyond operations, the data we collect, uh, it gives us confidence in our submitted invoices. It gives us concrete evidence for dispute resolution and insight into uh, upstream customer behavior. Projects for system improvement are currently utilizing this high resolution data with a holistic cost model to improve our power efficiency and optimize our profitability. Uh, we now have a continuous feedback loop uh, that is helping us move beyond automation and towards autonomy. Uh, the data informs the programming and strategy changes and we can see the effects quickly in real time to help us iterate towards more optimal solutions. And eventually, this will get us towards that autonomy we were talking about earlier uh, once we operationalize uh, this analytics more deeply. Um, and like Rick mentioned earlier, we earn pennies per barrel in the dirty water business uh, from real-time crisis mitigation to the high-level corporate strategy and everything in between. Our investment in this robust data infrastructure, it continues to pay dividends for us on so many levels. Uh, and so with that, I'll pass it back to Ross. Thanks, uh, Robert. Appreciate it. Um, before we jump into the uh, Q&A portion of the webinar, um, we wanted to quickly ask, you know, if you'd like to be contacted um, by a MOXA expert for one of your upcoming projects. Um, and as always, you know, we appreciate the opportunity to support you. 
thanks for uh, filling out that, that last poll. And then we'll jump right into the Q&A. All right, I'm back. So Thank thanks you. for uh, answering that last question, guys. I'll go ahead and shut that poll down. Um, but we have some pretty good questions here. Let's go ahead and uh, jump into the Q&A. Thank you, Rick, Robert, and Ross for that really great presentation. Um, just a reminder for our attendees, if you would like to submit questions, uh, please use that Q&A function, and we'll try to get to them during this part of our webinar. Um, so we have a few questions here already, um, some of them for Goodnight Midstream. Um, I'll go ahead and start with this one. Uh, are you guys using LTE for backhaul? Well, that's yes and no. Um, we utilize a combination of LTE, Starlink, um, a couple of the different satellite providers out there, fiber optic, narrow licensed narrowband radio, unlicensed narrowband radio. There's no one size fits all. So depending on the situation, we we build whatever we need to build to get out there and get the data back. Our our common go-to is LTE running IPsec encryption over LTE. We don't run anything over the open internet. That doesn't always work. You're running into locations where you just don't have enough coverage. You just don't have enough bandwidth. So we'll put in a narrowband radio, licensed narrowband radio. So we do go get our licenses with the FCC and stand up narrowband radio. But some locations, uh, they're big complex operations that are moving a lot of water and require communication back to a hub facility for automation purposes, we'll run fiber optic and we'll put that in place. So it varies. Okay. Thanks, Rick. <clears throat> Here's another one. Um, is Goodnight Midstream making use of AI to analyze this data? So yeah, we've um, we've attempted to use some AI uh, in leak detection before. We just haven't had um, great success with some of the deep learning methods. Uh, they're just not as good for this application as uh, some of the more traditional machine learning methods. Um, and we're in the process of kind of piloting some uh, more advanced AI, uh, taking in larger and more comprehensive data sets to try and optimize our, our business strategy. But um, at the moment, we do not have in operation any hardcore deep neural network or machine learning AI right now. Yeah, but I think that's a great point, right, Robert, like I was talking about earlier is, you know, you guys are finding what's the right fit, you know, for your organization, testing things out. Um, to totally. See at what extent you want to use it. So yeah, it's a great point. And, you know, we wouldn't even be able to explore these options without the data set that we have. So it's, that's a key point too. Yeah, here's another one, uh, possibly for you too, Robert. Uh, any mm -hmm. examples of interesting or surprising findings uh, once this data had been made available? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, recently we've come across uh, some significant savings that can be made on the power side. Um, so, you know, in the past, the power bill was just something that we had to pay. But with the real-time data, we're able to analyze exactly how the way our facilities operate affects our power bill pretty significantly. Uh, and so in real time, we can look at, you know, what exactly is our power usage here? And we can kind of project how different changes affect our, you know, our cost on the power side. So it's not really a fixed cost anymore to us. The power is becoming a variable cost that we can directly affect using this data set. And, you know, what we we're projecting, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of saving on the power side. Nice. Thanks, Robert. Um, here's a question about the uh, kiosk uh, use case that was talked about earlier. Uh, why a 301 instead of one of the panel computers for Moxa or the kiosk? Good question. We standardized on the 501 for all of our facilities for a number of reasons. Uh, the first one is our largest facilities would require a 501. And the second reason is we, we try to keep it as cookie cutter as possible so that if we have to swap hardware around, 
it's it's pretty seamless and straightforward. A lot of the times, if I'm working with remote hands at three o'clock in the morning, like I mentioned before, I I don't want to have to refamiliarize them with a whole other set of hardware. So we try to make it as cookie cutter as possible. So for that reason, even our facilities that don't need a 501 have a 501, want a cookie cutter as possible. For the kiosk, efficiency is key. If you look at how many trucks you have to run to pay for one of those kiosks, it, you know, it's a lot of trucks. Those things are not cheap. So the 301 is all we need to run that kiosk. And on top of that, that's different from the 501. There's no chance that anybody will ever confuse anything in that cabinet with a different cabinet. It's just all we needed to get the job done. So that's what we chose. Okay. Thanks, Rick. Uh, since oil fields are located in some of the harshest environments, are all of MOX's products certified for hazardous locations like Class 1 Div 2? Um, I'll take that one, uh, James. So not every single one of the products that we have are rated for C1D2, but that's simply because of where they're usually located within your architecture and your topology, right? So um, sometimes they don't need to be of that level, um, but all the ones that we discussed today and um, the ones at the beginning uh, that are going to be outside or in edge type cabinets um, that are dangerous for heat, temp, um, by all the nastiness that we get into with dust on um, the environment, our class one tip too. So good to go there. Um, here's another one. Any challenges coming from IT and trying to work with or integrate with OT teams and tech? You know, beyond the normal challenges of, you know, sometimes you just have a, a stubborn PLC that just doesn't want to communicate with SCADA properly. I would say no, not in this company, not on the personnel level. We've been fortunate enough that, you know, the people on the the IT side and the OT side, we're all nerds. You know, we may be specialized in a different area, but we're all still interested in technology and interested in making things better. So from a personnel standpoint of working together, not this company has been great. When we introduce new ideas and we come together at a table and discuss it between the two teams, there's always debate and there's always disagreement, but at the end of the day, we just choose to work together and move forward. So it hasn't been a problem. Okay. And That's real quick, I bet you, uh, I bet you it doesn't hurt that you have an IT background, right, Rick? So they trust you. They know you understand both sides of it, right? So. Yeah, there, you know, there's definitely some rapport there. We've been working together for years and we achieve things together and they realize that and it, it makes a difference. Yeah, for sure. Uh, here's one. Beyond operations, what is one business process that has been revolutionized by the availability of quality or high resolution data? Yeah, so, I mean, like I mentioned, um, you know, the conflict resolution is one thing if, and, you know, a confidence in our billing numbers. And so if we get a, a rejected invoice from a customer, we can go back in the data and we can see at a very granular level what's happening. Um, you know, there's been some disputes with uh, operators on, um, you know, the cause of, you know, high pressures on our system, you know, what's going on, can they get into the system and kind of we can go back and either say, yes, this is our fault, we know exactly what's going on here, or no, this is something on your side upstream. So it just gives us a lot of visibility into the true nature of e issues um, operationally. And that ultimately, at the end of the day, helps us get paid faster and on time. Here's a good one. Uh, do you have any recommendations or tips on how IT and OT can work more efficiently together to achieve things together? Also, have there been any cybersecurity concerns that you've had to consider and overcome during the system design or setup process? Well, that's a big one. That's a two-parter. Uh, recommendations and tips on how IT and OT, OT can work more effectively together. Um, I really don't have any tips because at this company, we've worked effectively effectively together since, since day one. And it's really about just having the right people in place and gathering them around a mission or in a goal or an achievement. And then just hearing people out, what's what's their approach? What's their approach? Why do you disagree and then work through it all? And at the end of the day, you know, as long as you're pulling people together for a common goal, 
if you've got the right people in place, it just happens. So it doesn't mean there won't be friction, but you will be effective at the end of the day. So I think having the right people in the right places is key for that. Um, that may not answer your question, but that's really what it comes down to. Uh, in terms of cybersecurity concerns, yes, absolutely. You know, that's actually not to sound like I'm doing a sales pitch here, but that's actually one of the positive things that moved Moxa to the top of the list for us. Those AIG 501s and the other AIGs come loaded with things pro out of the box. They have a firewall on them. So it allows us, I'd leverage that to help separation of my Purdue layers to separate out my OT and IT networks because it tends to live in both because the AIG has to live on the land to get internet connectivity, to get the connectivity out, but I don't want that system exposed. So I actually firewall it off at that location. TLS, you know, then you start getting into stuff like the uh, ignition deployment. The things, the way we design that, a lot of it was around cybersecurity. It's all outbound TLS connections to a restricted IP. So it's a trusted host, encrypted connection. It's it's pretty solid. Uh, for me to really get into that, we'd probably have to dive into the design aspects of the ignition setup. Not sure that would uh, be what we want to get into here, but we can dive into it if you guys want. Yeah, I think that was probably covered a little bit, Rick. Um, we did a couple months ago, actually, uh, Oliver Wang and um, Ignition Guys. We had a joint webinar in which we covered some of that, which um, you could actually probably find that on YouTube. Well, we could drop that or include that in the list to whoever asked the question uh, for some more information. Yeah, thanks. Since we kind of just touched upon like the AIGs right now, maybe I'll just read this one off then. Uh, do you also run the ignition edge on the 301 like you do on 501? Yeah, it's the exact same setup. Uh, works fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's the biggest positive impact that you see AI providing oil and gas customers in the future? Okay. I'll take a swing at that. Um... So I think we talked a little bit about some of those benefits earlier, um, but I think some of the ones that maybe uh, aren't thought of all the time is providing, it's not necessarily removing the necessary headcounts all the time. It's giving those people the time back to focus on what they need to focus on, right? The menial tasks, um, the 80% of their day sometimes that you know isn't really value added, they can be touching those assets. They can be analyzing the things to be able to really provide the benefit that, um, you know, they have the experience, right? With these pumps, valves, compressors, whatever it is in our industry, um, they're the experts of that for a reason. Um, give them back the time to be able to do that. I think that's probably one of the biggest things. It's not just removal of head, head count. It's improving, you know, the availability of your guys and girls to be able to use um, their expertise. more. Here's one touching upon the uh, poll question we had earlier today, but uh, where would Goodnight Midstream be classified on the scale of autonomous and automated? Well, that's a good one. There are certain aspects of the business that are completely automated, completely hands-off. And really, and this is where Robert's stuff comes in, there's aspects of the business that are more about autonomy. Let's get them the information they need to make good informed decisions. Let's say we're... We're probably somewhere in the middle. Robert, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think I'd agree. Um, you know, and we've got projects underway that are trying to kind of push us towards that um, that autonomous operation that we were talking about. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that we fall squarely in the middle on the uh, the automation side of things, and then you know, pushing towards autonomous. Thanks, guys. Here's another one. Are you using MXView1 to manage that network for the different radios? I'm assuming this is talking about the uh, like the narrowband radios and stuff. No, the managed narrowband radio networks are using the uh, Cambium Maestro. Okay. Uh, does Goodnight Midstream integrate their system with rig operators' systems? If so, how do you manage these connections to ensure they are secure? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, and it varies per customer. So in our simplest setups, it could be just a simple serial connection into their tank battery, giving us a permissive to turn on the pump. So as they're separating their oil and water, their water tanks fill up, 
we have a serial connection into their system that tells us, hey, you can turn on the pump now. That's in our more simple setups. The more complicated setups will actually pull tank level information and everything from the producer and make some decisions on our own. In the most complicated setups, we will actually pull a point-to-point -point virtual circuit between our facilities and their facilities and put a Modbus gateway on the producer side. So I'll set that up as a untrusted point-to-point -point IP network on my side. So I firewall it off because I don't trust the customer network at all. On their side, they will concentrate their data into a PLC and then we'll hook into that PLC with a Modbus gateway. It allows us to air gap the IP network and then we will pull concentrated information off that PLC. The main thing there is we want to make sure there's an air gap between the IP networks. We don't have any IP to IP connectivity with any of our, any of our customers because if anything gets compromised anywhere along that line, well, IP transport can go a long ways. It jumps through stuff. So when it comes to integrating with the customers, we make sure we don't have any IP to IP communications and we can keep it as simple as possible. If it's a DI just to turn on a pump, we'll do that because you're not going to hack that and get into my network. And if it's tank levels, hey, we'll do a Modbus connection and we'll do it over serial just to make sure we have that IP air gap. Okay. Thanks, Red. Uh, here's another one. How many data points does your system analyze across your enterprise? It's going to be two-parter. On the tag mm -hmm. side, I mentioned it before, we have 100 tags or so at our customer connections, 2,500 tags at a larger connection. Our largest system is around 20,000 tags and about 150,000 tags company-wide and growing. But that doesn't exactly equate to a data point that Robert crunches. Yeah, so um, the you know each tag is at sort of a one minute resolution at a minimum uh, pull rate, and then some are up to twenty seconds. Uh, and so ballpark probably fifty million readings a day to two hundred million readings a day, uh, but that's off of one hundred and fifty thousand tags. And some of them again are high resolution, and some of them are lower resolution. Okay, thanks, guys. Um, and I think this will probably be the last question, but um, what is the biggest benefit to Goodnight Midstream's operations that the analytics developed and deployed have provided? Honestly, it's our real-time crisis mitigation and um, just the eyes on the facility in real time. Um, our control room, they can review all this data uh, as it comes in. Um, and it just allows them to see issues with the telemetry or whatever. Uh, and then they can kind of mitigate any crisis that happens. So it, it's honestly just uh, that that's been a huge uh, comfort and helps. I think all of us at good night sleep at night is having real time, good data uh, that we can rely on. So. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah. I think that was actually the last question. So, um, you know, Everybody, thank you all uh, for joining today's webinar. Uh, we'll be sending out a follow-up email with a link to the recording so that you can revisit any of the topics that we covered today. Um, a survey will also appear when this session ends. Uh, we would appreciate it if you can give us your feedback on the, the webinar. And lastly, I just wanna also give a huge thank you to Ross, Rick, and Robert for sharing this awesome information. Um, as always, if there's anything you need, don't hesitate to reach out to us and have a good one, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.